Good afternoon. I hope you're enjoying the Innovation Summit so far, and I want to thank you for investing the time with us today. My name is Amr Paul. I'm the country president of Schneider Electric in the U.S., and I'll be hosting a panel today with some of our customers talking about how to make supply chains anti-fragile. Our goal is not just supply chains that are resilient, but supply chains that can respond to crises and be more agile as a consequence. That's what we mean by anti-fragility, and you heard some of that in Annette's talk earlier today. If we step back the last two decades, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about globalization. We've been looking at just-in-time supply chains. We've made assumptions about the free flow of data and the free flow of goods. COVID has been a stark reminder that that may not be true going forward. Nation boundaries have closed and moving goods from different countries in different supply routes has become increasingly complicated. But even before COVID, we were seeing the emergence of a multipolar world where data security, data access, where raw material access were all questions that were taking us and having us question our assumptions about a flat world. 69% of manufacturers are now taking those inputs accelerated by COVID and rethinking their supply chain footprints. Multi-shoring is becoming an increasing priority for a lot of these manufacturers. And the reason is we're going from just in time to just in case in our supply chain planning. The drivers of this are multi-tenant. We've talked a little bit about cybersecurity and the compliance needs. Those will only increase as we connect more of our infrastructure. Source of origin and traceability is super important. You'll hear from an executive in the commodities market as well as someone in the food supply chain. In both those cases, whether it's rare earth metals or knowing where your food was grown, whether it was organic or inorganic, if the farmers were paid fairly, all those things are things supply chains have to be accountable to their customers for. Social issues like labor costs, transport costs, the carbon footprint of how we have to transport goods, all are drivers and variables that go into this multivariable problem. So this notion of multi-shoring is about solving just one issue. It's taking all these complex factors at their intersection and rethinking supply chains. Now, one of the big enablers and how we deal with this complexity is the use of digital. And we have to make our factories more digital, whether it's more resilient in terms of their power infrastructure, more digital on the factory floor, more digital to enable worker efficiency, or more digital to make sure that we can monitor one factory or an enterprise level network and see where best practices can be shared. That capability is absolutely critical for us to be more responsive. Because ultimately, our goal here is not just to survive, it's to thrive. It's to lay a foundation where the next challenges, whether they're climate change or sustainability, are things we're better prepared for. We don't know exactly how this crisis will end or what the next one will be, but we do know that digital transformation is going to help us prepare to be more agile. At this point, I'd like to introduce our panel, and it's a privilege to have a collection of global experts who have lived and operated all over the world, managing some of the most complex supply chains in the world. First is Ken Engel, who's a Senior Vice President of Supply Chain from North America. Ken has been with Schneider Electric for over 27 years, working both in the North American market and in China, and he's been an integral part of us navigating this current crisis. So, Ken, thank you for joining us. Next, we have Paramita Das. Paramita has been in the commodities market her whole career, starting with BP and for the last several years with Rio Tinto. She has served as the Chief Transformation Officer of the Atlantic Region in the aluminum segment and also served as Chief of Staff to the CEO of Rio Tinto. Paramita, thank you for joining us. And finally, we have Stephen Hoika. Stephen has been with PepsiCo for over 30 years uh, in different supply chain, supply chain planning, and digital transformation roles. Recently, Stephen took over as the head of strategy and digital transformation for their Latin America market. Welcome, Stephen. All right. Well, look, Ken, I'm going to start with you uh, because, you know, we're going to warm up. So we'll start with Schneider people. Uh, one of the things that we are really excited about and I'm incredibly proud of, I know you are and our global team is, is that Lexington, Kentucky, a 62-year-old factory, 
has just been recognized as a World Economic Forum Lighthouse Factory for the digital transformation we've driven there. Um, it's a great story. It serves the market in incredibly dramatic ways uh, and has really helped us during this crisis as well. Tell us a little bit about the journey at Lexington, where we started from and what we've achieved. Well, thank you, Amr. We're very pleased with the Lexington Smart Factory recognition and it's extra special to me because 15 years ago, I was actually the plant manager of the Lexington factory. So, you know, to see the transformation and the success of implementing the EcoStructure platform there uh, into a brownfield facility and for it to be evolved and, and recognized by the World Economic Forum as an advanced smart factory is, is really amazing. I'm so proud of the Lexington team and, and the smart factory regional leadership team as well. You know, making a factory smart is more than just implementing one technology into the operations. It requires efficient integration into many interoperable technologies, which is why the, the open IoT platform of the EcoStructure uh, platform is, is key to the smart factory success. Effective change management is also very important and developing a, a culture of digitization is key to evolving the smart factory transformation. Things have, that have worked for us are such as peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, employee uh, pilot phases that we've done and cross-site collaboration between the facilities to ensure rapid adoption and appreciation of the new technologies to make workers' jobs safer and more productive. You know, the Snyder EcoStructure platform does provide our customers with a, an open and, as I mentioned, interoperable platform to evolve any factory into a smart factory at their desired pace and effectiveness that, that is desired. You know, we continue to take the same approach that we started many years ago. We refer to it as think big, act small, and scale fast. You know, thinking big, uh, ours is a strategic platform. It's a global platform that ensures global standardization and best practice sharing and a platform for continued innovation with a network of smart factory experts that are connected globally around the world. And then acting small, it, it needs to be localized according to each factory situation, considering the specific customer situation and business needs and alignment with the targeted financial budgets as well. There's three levels of smart factories in Snyder Electric. They're standard, step up, and advanced. The standard is simply connected products to, to start off with in an introductory phase. Step up is meaning a factory that has exhibited lean digital capability. And then finally, advanced is a factory with a high level of platforming and data analytics that is being used. And the third point, scaling fast, refers to how we execute. Acting small across the global footprint enables testing and piloting of new innovations quickly. New solutions are first validated and governed by a global steering committee that is regionally evaluated for deployment in the final stages. Many of these digital tools only require a small investment because they rely and leverage manufacturing systems that are already in place such as human machine interfaces. So in summary, Amr, that's how we did it in Lexington, and that's the same approach that we use for all of our factories, regardless of whether it's a brownfield or a greenfield factory. Hope that was helpful. That's great, and I love the pragmatism of that journey. Um, you know, one of the great uh, serendipities about this panel is that uh, Steve and his team at PepsiCo, about 30 strong, were actually all set to go visit Monterey, which is another one of our advanced factories. And that happened right around uh, the beginning of the COVID pandemic in North America. And so everyone pivoted. And Steve, if I understand it correctly, your whole team and yourself actually visited Lexington, but in a virtual fashion. Tell us a little bit about that visit and, and what your takeaways were. Oh, thank you. Yes, it, it was great. Um, we were originally uh, as a team of about 30 of the operational leadership for LATAM, PepsiCo LATAM. Uh, we were originally scheduled to tour the Monterey facility in Mexico, um, and that was in April. Uh, originally, that was the schedule. And of course, we were unable to make that happen because of uh, the COVID situation. Um, but the, 
I think it actually worked out better um, to do the virtual tour in Lexington. Um, and there was really a couple significant, I don't know, first impressions or immediate takeaways uh, from that, the tour in, in Lexington. One, it, it's a journey. And I, I think we saw that and Ken talked to it a little bit and what he was talking about that there's this pilot process. There's a learn process to figure out exactly which technologies um, and integration of information that's going to make the most sense and deliver the biggest benefit for the most value or with the best value. Um, and that, so that was I think it was good for the Latam leadership to see that, uh, that it had been a journey even for Lexington and being a brownfield site, I think it was also significant, right? So a lot of people think about when you're talking about uh, digitalization or smart factories that you're building new, and that's not typically the case. I would think probably more often than not, uh, it is retrofitting brownfield sites. Uh, those sites have been around for a while in most cases. They're strategic to the business. That's why they're there originally. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to focus efforts on taking those strategic sites and updating them and making them smart and digitizing those processes to even drive more efficiency and business value uh, with the brownfield. So those two things, I think, were uh, substantial in the original first impression in, as we went through the tour. I mean, there was a couple other things, obviously. And I think, the, as I was mentioning, the fact that the tour was pulled off virtually was great. I think that actually even emphasized <laughs> Uh, the, the nature of the digital journey and the, you know, that, that uh, transformation that we're all on in terms of uh, becoming much more virtual and effective controlling uh, virtually or autonomously. Uh, so the fact that we were able to effectively uh, basically conduct a complete tour, right? We went through an entire tour of the facility uh, virtually, I think was act, it was even more impactful than to do it on, to do it on site. So uh, those were really the key uh, significant takeaways. And from that, uh, there was, there's clearly some actions that we took away, right? Uh, the intent was to understand exactly what capabilities were out there, what Snyder has done, kind of what, what their journey had been and so forth. Um, but the ability to, uh, really sense the operation and provide, uh, visibility and more of an alert type approach to the entire manufacturing process is obviously where we all are trying to get to. And to see that in action in, uh, in uh, the Lexington facility was absolutely phenomenal. You know, uh, thank you for investing the time. I know we have a long partnership and a great relationship with PepsiCo, and we appreciate that investment. But I've been joking with Ken that his team are probably our best salespeople because ultimately customers want to talk to <laughs> practitioners. They want to talk to other people who've walked a mile in their shoes and dealt with the same problems. So uh, we appreciate the team in Lexington and everything they do to tell that story to our customers. Now, You've recently taken on a new role. Uh, you've been in supply chain, supply chain planning, digital transformation, and uh, you were telling me that the company identified the Latin America market as a key priority, and, and it was an exciting uh, opportunity for you to take that on and drive digital transformation in that market. So as someone coming in with that new uh, responsibility for, for a big part of the growing population of the world, really, Give us what's on your to-do list. Uh, I know earlier in the call, you actually had to move your stack of things so we could get a clear picture. So I know it's a big stack. I, I saw that for sure. But tell us about the plan as you begin the digitization journey for Latin America. Well, uh, great question. I think they, like PepsiCo, most sites or most companies are in a very similar situation. It, it's really about... In, uh, depending on where you are in your journey, you've either experienced this or you're about to experience it. Um, but the some of the initial steps, there's uh, several foundational elements that obviously need to be in place in order to even ingest information. Um, that and the capturing of information is obviously very important. It all comes down to uh, where you're pulling or putting sensors, how you're sensing the operation, specifically in manufacturing, of what's happening within the process, capturing that information and putting in a uh, a location that can then be leveraged to uh, derive uh, d additional insights or alerts or what have you. Um, we're very much in the process of doing so. And our strategy is 
broader than just manufacturing. It spans the entire value chain, but we're approaching it very similarly. It's about the capturing of information and the sharing of information across the value chain where it makes sense and can derive value. And that's really what uh, we've been focused on. That's where my team is focused on currently in terms of uh, developing those capabilities to capture that information across the value chain, uh, specifically in manufacturing. Uh, manu- MES uh, systems obviously are a big part of capturing that information and understanding what's happening across the entire process to be able to leverage that information then across the gamut within manufacturing, whether it's driving efficiency or reducing uh, climate impact in terms of water uses, electricity, et cetera. Um, so across the gamut, and that's really uh, where we're focused on currently in, in Latin America. Um, I would say coming from a, a supply chain, originally a supply chain background and having uh, walked many, many miles in the foot, you know, in, in, in those shoes within manufacturing as well, uh, actually I think plays a really critical role in establishing uh, where we're heading and how that that roadmap or path to get there. Um, the supply chain system that we're currently implementing across Latin America really serves as a starting point. It is foundational. It's it's a platform similar to your ERP or transactional system uh, that can then be leveraged to advance capabilities and technologies beyond that starting point. Um, so those supply chain systems that we're currently in the middle of implementing in in Latin America are going to serve as uh, basically a a foundation or launching point for some of those more sophisticated, uh, advanced capabilities like AI, ML, uh, things of that nature as we pull that information in, as well as the gateway to share that information across uh, the entire value chain. If you think planning is your backbone, uh, you're planning from raw material acquisition all the way to how you replenishment. Uh, downstream nodes within your supply chain and ultimately your customer. So that information and the ability to capture from different parts of the the entire value chain and then share it effectively across the entire uh, end-to-end value chain is absolutely where we're heading in order to drive that significant value. You know, I really appreciate the way you described it as an atomic uh, sensing unit with a part of a process, then a plant, and then an entire enterprise or uh, enterprise-wide process and how you scale up and down and digital transformation really affects every stage of that. It makes a lot of sense. You mentioned raw material, so that seems like uh, the appropriate transition to uh, have a word with Paramita. So the world's raw material, Rio Tinto sort of powers almost everything we do in one shape or form. And you have this incredible challenge of keeping all that going while also thinking about sustainability Uh, while also making sure that real-time information is gathered. So you have a lot of competing priorities. Tell us a little bit about how you think about the balance between all those vectors uh, as you navigate not just this crisis, but your own digital transformation. Thanks, Alma. Great question. If if you allow me to pivot uh, off what uh, Ken and Steve actually mentioned, Uh, you had introduced me as having a linkage to London, but... um, what didn't, uh, wasn't said was I actually have a linkage back to Kentucky as well. So I've lived in Louisville, Kentucky now from Lexington for quite some time. So I um, can completely appreciate uh, the beauty of that region and uh, has a special place in my heart. My son was actually born there. So definitely a very special place in my heart. Um, Rio is, um, you know, our purpose is essentially driving human progress um, with our materials. And we take our purpose very seriously. Um, we are, if this is a short introduction, uh, we are 147 plus years. So we have gone through uh, two world wars, a few pandemics, and every one of them have been a learning experience. So will this be. Um, we are into almost every material that uh, you know we look around ourselves, whether it's a car, um, a can, a beverage can, hopefully somewhere in uh, Stephen's products. but. Um, and uh, aer- 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 aerospace products, our airplanes, um, the buildings that we are all sitting in, everything. We, we are in everything. Uh, but we humbly understand that if we are categorized as an essential service for all jurisdictions that we participate in, means that we also have to make our supply chain work for our customers and for the products that we are servicing. And that's where uh, we we were very much on our toes through the past nine months as we dealt with the pandemic. 
Now, we, of course, have the, our operations uh, globally in 50, 60 locations. So uh, we saw this coming as uh, it started off in China and moved its way across the globe. Um, I will first kind of speak about the three things that are intrinsically tied that have come across uh, in the last uh, nine plus months, but the journey started for us for a very long time. So one thing we can say for sure is the world is now different. We can all agree on that, that when we all open the doors and step out, the world is going to be completely different. It's not going to be the world that we left when we all said, you know what, there is a pandemic, let's go back home. The second piece is going to be the geopolitical environment has become very tense. Just jurisdictional nationalism has risen and uh, a global company like ours has to move material around, many materials, has to move them around different jurisdictions. So for us, navigating that environment is very critical. Um, but if you think about it, the world that is different, consumer behavior has also changed. People who are looking at products, and I'll take Stephen's products, when they pick up a Pepsi can, they want to know where did the material originate from? The consciousness about that material identity has heightened exponentially during this uh, COVID and pandemic timeframe. Geopolitical uh, reasons has accentuated that those asks even more because now they want to know, was it coming from a conflict uh, area region? Where was it mined? Were there things mined and uh, manufactured carefully, ethically, responsibly? So responsible production, responsible sourcing has taken a very heightened uh, definition. And the third very important uh, parameter is COVID at a moment's notice kind of sent many of our own folks from the, uh, the concentrated offices into home offices. So just to make a point, one office in Chicago just in a moment's notice became 5,000 offices around uh, different zip codes in the US. People stayed in Chicago, some people didn't. But one of the things that we noticed across the whole pattern was um, the link back for us also to be accelerated in our digital transformation journey. We had to get that out sooner, faster, quicker, because A, we needed to connect our people amongst ourselves to keep the work going, operations going. We take uh, being essential services uh, for ourselves very seriously. The second piece was connectivity back to the customers. For us, and I'm, I'm very biased, as I said, to Amir, I sit in commercial, so for me, customers always make, uh, you know, their voices are always the first that I hear. So what are our customers saying? How do we make sure that um, what they need, we can actually cater to? And the third piece is making sure that uh, we are able to move the material in a very responsible manner. All of this is only critical and uh, possible, enabled by digital. And today, data and facts are actually helping us get our stories around. Now, I say this in the current environment, but for Rio, as I said, we've gone through a few pandemics and a couple of world wars and a lot of learning. And hopefully this will also kind of make smarter for the next uh, 148 years that we hope to be on the face of the earth. Um, but one of the thing was, how do we do that in a smart, efficient and time effective manner? At the same time, making sure that we are making those small changes for our organizations. All our three companies are um, major global companies. So we know that you know when you have to cause change, you have to stream change for a long time before the ship moves around even one nautical mile. So we, uh, what was very refreshing was the digital transformation. What we were hoping for three years got done in three months. Suddenly we were out there to, uh, with the digital spectrum, helping our suppliers and our customers with solutions, and the whole ecosystem came together. That's the beauty of this, that we managed to prove to the world that when the ecosystem works together, the supply chain works, and materials will move, products will get made responsibly, ethically, in the most sustainable manner. And um, in the new world, when we open the door and get out, we know that uh, the, the world is going to associate the pandemic with several um, sustainability factors. It's already doing it. It's just natural human psychology. So we as a car, as a uh, ecosystem have to be ready to answer that. And I think we are breaking paradigms where it's not just about what we do in the current digital uh, products, but we are experimenting with cutting edge technology like blockchain. 
and uh, AI. So we've been with AI for a very long time, especially when you're going to the center of the earth or uh, you know mining in uh, a space which literally looks like Mars. You, you get to use technology and uh, we're realizing that those technology is now helping us address uh, solutions for sustainability and uh, address the needs for our customers and their consumers. So we look at the supply chain through customers like uh, Steven, like you know PepsiCo, and they look at the consumers, but we need to hear them so that we can be better prepared in answering their solutions or their asks for sustainability, supply chain, essential services, and us as a company and as a global citizen. Um, back to you. you know, I, I love that. I mean, there's so many themes you picked up on. Um, the best time to prepare for a crisis is before you find yourself in one. So the fact that you'd been investing in this digital backbone allowed you to accelerate. That foundation then creates network effects, both in terms of the additional technologies you can build on top, but also the connectivity with your customers, with your own employees. Um, so, so thank you for that very rich tapestry of how that works at Rio Tinto. It's very helpful. You know, Paramita just brought up this notion of, of customer resilience and the ability to respond in any environment. And Ken, I know we've had some challenges at Schneider, especially in North America, uh, navigating COVID. Uh, I know your team has invested in everything from building respirators to mass making machines, first for our own consumption and then to donate to the community. Uh, we have a very global supply chain with input streams from India, Philippines, China, uh, to name a few. So tell us a little bit about how you and the team uh, in the Schneider supply chain in North America have navigated this crisis and how digital has enabled you to keep servicing our customers. Absolutely, Amr. And, you know, I'm going to start off with uh, what is our number one priority here in Schneider Electric, and that's the safety of our people. You know, as such, we strictly limit the non-essential visitors into our factories and distribution centers. And this includes internal and external visitors. Our safety protocols remain fully enforced until further notice to keep our people safe and our supply chain active. You know, regarding the changes, Amr, to our supply chain strategy, it's really that there's so many changes to make our su supply chain more robust in this new world that we live in today. You know, we're changing from a just-in-time supply chain to a just-in-case supply chain. You know, COVID has lowered the water level to expose the supply chain vulnerabilities across the globe. In general, our supply chain, you know, was set up to GIT principles, and we're now taking it to a different level to make it more robust and flexible and agile and resilient. For our long, complex supply chains, one of the more interesting things that we're doing, um, we're now working side by side with one of the top academic supply chain intellects of the world. We're now meeting weekly with Dr. Levy, who is in charge of the MIT Supply Chain Analytics. He and his team of PhD students have agreed to work with us on a project basis to reset how we manage our most difficult and complex and longest supply chains. We've already made some changes based on our learnings and studies with Dr. Levy and his team. One of the actions that we've already taken is to increase uh, the number of material references and the inventory of over 5,000 different references of material in the supply chain and added over $30 million of, of pipeline inventory to support our customers. Now there's many more actions that we're gonna take other than just adding buffer inventory. Um, this is gonna be a, a complex long project and we're making a lot of headway with Dr. Levy and his team. We've also made changes to our capacity management process and our, our, how we govern our capacity, both to factories and to our upstream suppliers. Our past JIT practices of capacity management are no longer adequate to provide the level of flexibility and resilience that our customers need and expect. So we've changed the system of management to include more reserved capacity and flexibility. And we have to do that while we're still managing costs. We've also made leadership changes to how that uh, capacity process and system of management is working. We're investing over $25 million before the end of this year on additional flexible capacity, smart factory type of capacity. And we're gonna invest another 50 million in 2021 
to do the same, to align capacity expectations for improved customer experience and business continuity. So in summary, Amr, on a, on a larger scale and in support of our continued digital transformation, we remain completely focused and committed to the evolution of our smart factory and smart supply chain digital transformations. We've already seen the value in, in these investments through the en enhanced process insight, the greater communication clarity, and the increased energy efficiency of these smart factories. We plan to continue this digitization to further increase responsiveness, resiliency for our customers and for our stakeholders. Thank you, Ken. You know, this notion of going from just in time to just in case is really interesting. And for the last decade, all of us in different forms and different parts of our roles have have been focused on globalization. And then all of a sudden, this pandemic reminded us that state boundaries can actually close, that what we took for granted as transport links may not be available to us anymore. And so those resilient plans that were theoretical scenarios are now practical realities and, and we're having to rethink and these notions of power of two are, are really important concepts now that we're learning from. So thank you for everything you and your team are doing to serve our customers because um, I can only agree with Paramita that it all starts with them. Which actually brings me back to you, Paramita. You, you sit in a really enviable position in that you look at the global aluminum market very closely for one of the largest producers. Uh, and so you have a really interesting platform to see how manufacturing might be shifting and how companies globally are reacting to this changed landscape that Ken was describing. What do you see from your standpoint? You know, there's a lot of conversation about multi-shoring, about rethinking supply chains, but the commodities flow is where the truth is of where actually raw material is going. So tell us, tell us what the rest of the world doesn't know about how the future supply chains are going to look. I wouldn't uh, say the rest of the world doesn't know, Amir. I can only humbly say we'll probably speak about things that everybody is looking around and seeing. Um, look, uh, you, you call it multi-shoring here in Rio. We call it near-shoring. What we are seeing is... Um, uh, the geo intersection of uh, COVID, pandemic uh, realization, geopolitical constraints, and a kind of a nationalistic feelings in different jurisdictions has risen. And uh, supply chains are looking at it and saying, the volatility in the supply chain is only going to increase. So how do we make sure that the supply chain becomes shorter and quicker and faster, but more nearer to me? So we are seeing a lot of nearshoring, a lot of qualifications from OEMs where they're saying, okay, what are the materials that are uh, closely available to me? And if it's not available to me at the most cost-effective manner, then how do I get the data to give me the guarantee that my supply chain is kosher and it's clean and it's, uh, you know, uh, sanitized? One of the things is uh, that we are also recognizing, like I'll, I'll give you a clear example for aluminium. USMCA was a big topic for our North American region this year. Along with it comes rules of origin. And the OEMs have to have now the uh, requirements of assurance and compliance to the US government about the amount of material that is used within the North American shores. Now, you know, we are a global company. We make the virgin material, but we really can't make it and look the other way just because there is a supply demand dynamics that, ha that happens. We have to work with our customers and our end users in ensuring that they are able to meet their compliance requirements. So we are working with them and ensuring that they have the data facts in a digital format. Believe it or not, we are actually uh, trying to get it in a very speedy manner to our OEM such that they can report out in a speedy manner from their organizations. Um, and we are combining it. It's not just about provenance of the metal, but it's also about what are the supply chain green credentials that go with it. And we believe that uh, transparency, traceability, with the proper sustainability credentials in an assurance model is the way to go. And combined with that in a transparent manner when you're able to lay out the supply chain, it will work for uh, the OEMs for what they need to do. So we are absolutely supporting our customers around it. Um, an example of that, and uh, you would have probably seen, we recently struck a partnership with Anheuser-Busch InBev for um, low carbon future 
for all their beverage can requirements. And uh, this is going to start in North America, but we are hoping it's a global uh, partnership. So we are going to hope, we are hoping to take it uh, to other jurisdictions. But one of the fear, uh, you know, foundations of that is also the traceability side. How do we ensure that our material and the sustainability credentials are very transparent for them to use? I know Schneider is helping us with uh, digital transformation for many of our assets. Um, in aluminium, we are also making sure our products, or just for all our uh, assets actually, or our product suites, they're making sure our products have the green credentials that can be used by our consumers and our customers. So I'll mention my very favorite uh, joint venture, Alysis, with um, Alcoa, supported by Apple, the government of Canada and Quebec. Uh, we are no longer talking about credentials um, and nearshoring for low carbon footprint. We are talking about a zero carbon footprint with this metal. Mm. And um, um, I always like to mention, we don't get to promote enough, but this is not a zero carbon only. There's a positive oxygen metal. We are emitting oxygen. Mm -hmm in this matter. How much better can those credentials be? Combine it with everything that uh, Stephen mentioned, air, water, emissions, uh, you know, diversity, uh, biodiversity. This has to be a more holistic view. Now that's more for aluminium armor, but I will quickly touch upon other features like pop-up. We have gone and transformed our, our Kennecott mine, which is one of the oldest copper mines on, the, on, on Earth. We've transformed that into 100% renewable energy. We are very, very proud of uh, the work that has been done by our operations at Kennecott, and I know Schneider is uh, working with us over there as well. Um, but, you know, taking the work internally on what we do within our mind site and making sure that we are pushing ourselves for the sustainability metric and then working with the supply chain to make sure we are helping them in their nearshoring uh, aims, objectives, and helping them address their consumer needs is what we need to do. So it has to uh, you know, be an end-to-end -end process. Um, but do we see a future where um, OEMs will probably require us to trace the supply chain and make sure that we are giving them the supply chain, which is uh, uh, pandemic proof, uh, digital proof, absolutely. And I'll end uh, very quickly with one of the examples that come to my mind. Earlier on, before COVID, if there was any issue, what we would do, we would take five experts globally, put them in a plane together and say, go to the site. Let's just uh, hypothetically say our copper mine, which is really digging into the center of the earth, our OT mine in Mongolia, go to Mongolia and fix the problem. But guess what? With the pandemic, we learned we can't put five people together, not safe. We can't put them on a plane, not safe. And oh, by the way, we can't fly them to Mongolia because we don't know if we can fly them back. So digital really helped us actually solve that. And thank God for all the investment Rio made in digital uh, historically, because now the five experts could be in different parts of the world, but still fix the problem. Uh, because now uh, jurisdictional issues have taken a different meaning with pandemic as well. So. A lot more on this chapter, Amir, as we see. A lot more to come.